Hello everybody, welcome to Dry Dock episode 22, and uh, I hope you're all enjoying yourselves as we come close to the end of the year, and let's get on with the questions. SPQR 2755 says, At the Falklands in 1914, would von Spee have been better off attacking the British in Stanley Harbour while they were coaling rather than trying to make a run for it? Would he have stood a chance of disabling the two Invincibles? Well, the answer to that is yes and possibly no. So, historically, von Spee came quite close to Stanley Harbour with the intention of bombarding it, and then he saw the two tripod masts, well, the multiple tripod masts of the two battle cruisers that were waiting there and went, ah, uh, no, I'm going to try and be elsewhere as soon as humanly possible. Coupled with this was a bombardment from HMS Canopus, a pre-dreadnought that had been beached in, uh, well, put on the mudflats inside the harbour and cut down and camouflaged to disguise it and was bombarding them using observations from a shore observer firing over land. The entrance to Port Stanley, you see, is actually quite narrow. So whilst in theory, yes, uh, completely stationary battle cruisers that would still need some time to get up to steam are probably the best chance that he's going to have of landing repeated sustained hits on the battle cruisers. The problem he's going to have is that the battle cruisers themselves are going to be obscured behind the land, and all he can see is the tripod mast. So he can take a relatively decent uh, estimate of range, but actually spotting the fall of shot and how it is relative to the ships is going to be harder than it would be if he just had a clear line of sight to it. And of course, Canopus is firing back. And there's nothing to stop the observation men on the hills around Port Stanley from also communicating the uh, German ship's positions to the British battle cruisers, who could also then start firing back themselves. So it's a bit of a, a bit of an odd situation in which the British gunnery, in theory, should be a lot better because they're completely stationary and they have a stationary observer who's got all the time in the world to tell them exactly where their shot is falling. At the same time being stationary, they are more vulnerable targets, but they're obscured by the lad, which makes them harder targets. So it could go either way, to be honest. I think it would basically come down to who whose gun crews could zero in the faster. If uh, Von Spee's crews can take some decent range estimates and make some lucky guesses based on water spouts that they can only half see, then once they found the range, they could just keep hitting the British uh, battle cruisers, as, as long as they get close enough for those sh shots to be effective, they could potentially cripple them. The flip side to that is that um, they could also be hit repeatedly by 12-inch shells in fairly short order and caught quite flat-footed when the smaller cruisers and such come out to engage them in, and with them already in a damaged condition. So yeah, uh, it's kind of... it would have gone... Much better or much worse, flip a coin and decide whichever way it might have gone. Pekka Makella, I think, there's too many umlauts in there for me to hazard a decent pronunciation, um, says that the manual for the Tiger tank called for angling the hull front corner towards enemy tanks to make the impact angle more favourable for the armour. Was the same ever done with battleships sailing not in a parallel angle, but at an angle to more towards the enemy would increase the effective thickness of the armour. Well, obviously you do see this done quite a bit in uh, games like World of Warships, but to be honest, it, when you're talking about battleships, the kind of angling part is already built in to a degree in long-range gunnery, because by the time you're engaging an enemy at 15, 20,000 yards, the shells themselves are actually coming in at a relatively steep angle, which is already increasing the overall effective thickness of your armour. And on top of that, quite a number of designs actually had angled internal armour, which increased that apparent angle even more. The eye was being possibly one of the most famous examples uh, of that. So there is already a degree of angling of armour to increase apparent thickness uh, involved. The thing is that compared to the angle of drop the angle the apparent ag angle increase in armor that you could get from angling your ship is not that great before you start to uh, get into the realms of masking your own rear guns because you'll you've increased the uh, the angle of your ship 
and also you're changing the range of the engagement, which earlier on in sort of maybe World War One period, changing the relative uh, rate of change between the two ships will cause problems for your fire control computers and accuracy, but even later on when that's less of the case, when as fire control computers get more accurate, you also have the complication that you are changing the range and obviously you're most likely going to be closing the range, which means that you are going to be increasing the shell's effectiveness against you, the enemy shell's effectiveness against you. And when you're talking about naval shells, you can very rapidly get to a point at closer range gunfights where it doesn't matter how angled you are and it doesn't matter what thickness of bomb you started out with, the shell's going to punch straight through. And you don't really want to end up in that situation. Uh, and if you try and turn away, when you get to that point, you've now gone broadside on and absolutely minimised your uh, hull th uh, armour thickness right in time for someone to put a broadside straight through into your magazines, which is not what you want. So, yeah, basically between the fact that due to the sheer range that a certain amount of that is already built in and the aforementioned issues with tracking and uh, increase uh, possibly increasing armour penetration on your enemy's side just as much as your own, angling the ship itself wasn't so much of a concern for increasing your protection, uh, although small amounts of angle were put in just, just to, for a little bit of extra benefit. Richard Cutts asks, I've read how fuel was a problem for the British while hunting the Bismarck. I understand that running at high speed will cause them to use up their fuel much faster, so why didn't the Royal Navy deploy tankers to refuel? The books I've read don't even mention the possibility of refueling at sea. If I didn't know better, I'd think they lacked the capability, which is ridiculous. So, it wasn't that they lacked the capability, but their capability was pretty terrible. And this stemmed from two factors. One was that the British Empire had multiple bases all over the place, so they didn't tend to need ships that could go spectacularly long distances without refueling, because they'd always be able to pull into a port um, if they needed to. And that isn't to say they made incredibly short-range ships like the Italians did. They they did still go for long range. It just wasn't the stupidly long range that the Americans tended to have. Um, but also, I know, this, I know it sounds a bit stupid, they kind of assumed that the enemy would want to fight them, and if they didn't, they'd be able to hide, find them fairly quickly. They hadn't really thought of uh, an, an enemy battleship re both refusing battle and running away very effectively to the point they couldn't find it. Um, so the kind of Bismarck chase scenario was not something they'd imagined, Um and on top of all that, you've got to understand that a lot of the Royal Navy ships that went after it were very much a scratch force. The ships that were sent after them uh, to start with, fully fueled up, ready to go, were of course Prince of Wales and Hood, and we all know how well that ended. Um, King George V was scrambled from the home fleet, but Rodney was pulled off of convoy escort duty as were a number of other ships, so they'd got out and burned a certain amount of fuel already, and being on convoy escort duty and things like that, they hadn't really thought there'd be a need to bring along fleet oilers, so they didn't, physically didn't have them with them. Um, fleet oilers also tended to be slower than the battle fleet, and because of the rush to catch the Bismarck, they'd been running at full pelt, so they would have left any fleet oilers they uh, theoretically might have been called in from the UK, they would have left them behind. And finally, as I said, the, because they hadn't developed the need for, for it at that point, their doctrine about how to refuel was pretty terrible. They discovered this um, during early operations in the Pacific as compared to the USN. So the original uh, Royal Navy idea of how to refuel at sea was a rather complicated conga line um, where ships followed each other and refueled that way. But that was quite, as you might imagine, quite difficult to do. Hoses kept parting, uh, ships get too close, ships get too far, etc, etc, and you could only do it one at a time. And They actually had to learn from the US Navy about the side-by-side -side method of doing things, which not only let you refuel more than one ship at a time, but was also much less subject to the variances of ships differing speeds, and was a lot easier to manage. So, 
Yeah, it was basically a combination of all of those factors, uh, but the two primary ones being that half of the ships involved or more were pulled off of duties where there wouldn't have been a fleet oiler because they were expecting to be convoy escorts, and the other half of which was the sheer rush to catch the Bismarck meant that even if there had been fleet oilers sent out from the home fleet, they probably would have outrun them anyway, and they didn't have the time to slow down and do a, a fleet refuel before the Bismarck would have got away. M.W. Troller says, Why didn't warships use projectiles in the style with those seen in tanks, or did they? So things like Heat, Hesh, APBC, APCBB, BC even, uh, AFPDS, etc., etc. Well, the simple answer is sheer size of battleships. Uh, obviously, that's not really going to help much, so I'll explain it in a little bit, little bit more detail. Basically, with a tank... Almost everything inside a tank is vital, so as long as you can get through the armour, once you're through the armour, basically anything that happens inside, whether you're putting a jet of molten metal in, a bit of explosive, or just a solid high-velocity piece of shot, or a bunch of shrapnel, it's all going to hit something quite vital and stop the tank from working, either through breaking stuff or killing the crew, which I suppose is technically breaking stuff. Um... But with warships, they're so much bigger that the damage effects caused by most of the round types that you list just wouldn't do all that much. Because bear in mind the scale. I mean, you look at a modern tank, you're talking about between probably 60 tons peacetime weight up to 80 tons or so wartime weight for a Western tank like an Abrams or a Challenger or maybe a Leopard 2, something like that. Um, but they're firing 120 millimeter guns at each other, so roughly four inch shells. So you might think, oh yeah, but well, uh, like a 16 inch battleship shell, or well, that's four times the size linearly, um, and so it's going to be significantly more than that uh, volumetrically, because remember, obviously, you increase it by linear, then increase by area, then in and increase by volume is uh, one times. Uh, squared and then cubed so you're talking about four cubed times the size so uh, a 16 inch shell for example compared to a four inch shell is 64 times the volume so that sounds quite a lot but when you look at 64 times a tank you don't get anywhere close to a battleship I mean scaling up a tank uh, by the same amount uh, or sort of four times in all dimensions you end up with a very very weird vaguely cubic shape about half the size of a sloop or a corvette from the world war ii period scaling up by the say by this uh, sort of 64 times by weight gets you something about the size of a very very pathetic light cruiser but that's mainly because tanks are almost entirely armor by weight so there you go but how does this actually uh, change anything, I hear you ask? Well, it's simply the fact that a battleship has a vastly more internal space to absorb damage. So you are going to end up with the kind of, as I say, the damage dealing effects of most of these rounds. A battleship's not even going to notice. So uh, something like a Heat or a Hesh round, yes, it will poke a hole like a 16-inch hole or something like that in the side of a battleship. But the effect that it uses to punch that hole straight through the armour dissipates fairly quickly. This is why spaced armour is so effective against these kind of uh, rounds when it comes to tanks. And a ship's internal volume is effectively free spaced armour. So, yeah, yeah I say, you, you'll punch a small hole for the size of the battleship in it and they probably won't even notice until some unlucky damage control party comes across a bit of extra work um and that's i mean basically your, your best chance of doing damage with a something like that is uh with a heat or hesh equivalent round is going to be setting fire to something internally but again ships have firefighting systems and it's a relatively small part of the ship you set on fire uh, maybe if you hit the turrets you might be able to set off some ammunition and that might do something, or maybe the barbette or something, but that's a very, very edge case scenario. And if you are talking about uh, just kinetic rounds, things like Sabo rounds and uh, that kind of thing, again, it's a case of, well, 
yes, well done, you've punched a very small hole in my ship. Congratulations, do you want a medal? <laughs> um, the, the amount of structural beams, decks, uh, possible armor decks, bulkheads, etc. between the side of the ship and anything important is going to either distort, break up, or deflect any kind of just sheer solid penetrator long before it gets anywhere useful and once it expends its energy it's just as I say, it sits there with a small hole in the side of the ship uh, this is why battleship ap rounds consist of the necessary armor piercing to get the round through the side of the ship hopefully or through the turret armor or whatever it is that it's hitting but when that round fetches up inside the ship or has traveled a certain distance inside the ship it explodes because it needs to to the explosion is really unless you're incredibly lucky is really what's going to do the actual damage um, if the shells only barely made it through the armor only partially, or only partially made it through the armor the explosion should in theory rip a much bigger hole in the armor which obviously allows water in which is a bad thing for a ship and if it's managed to punch clean through and it detonates quite deeply inside the ship the explosion might do some damage but also the shell splinters will do considerable amounts of damage and that is how you knock a battleship out of action uh, you've basically got to bypass its massive volumetric defense um, caused by its sheer size to get deep enough into the ship to be somewhere near something vital and then you've got to explode in order to do the maximum amount of possible damage once you get there so that's whereas as i say with tanks once you're inside you basically you are going to do vital damage whatever you do so that's why the, the damage models the damage methods used by tank shells and battleship shells nowadays are quite different uh, because of the targets themselves being quite different f12 mnb asks uh for the original Dreadnought and on up, as the size of guns got bigger, the size of shells and the amount of powder used would also increase. So did the total number of rounds decrease, or were the magazines bigger in large battleships proportionally? Uh, so I basically, as guns got bigger, did the number of rounds carried drop? No. Weirdly enough, the answer is actually basically the opposite, um, believe it or not. Um, so when you look at the number of shells carried in the very first uh, dreadnought battleships things like the nassau the dreadnought the south carolina etc depending on the ship of the navy in question they're usually carrying between 70 and 80 rounds per gun um i say depending on exactly which ship you're looking at um but when you go to the far end, when you're looking at things like uh, the Iowa, the Nelson, or the Bismarck ships that were carrying the biggest guns uh, fielded on battleships of those particular nations, you actually find that the round stowage has gone up to between roughly 100 to 120 rounds per gun, again, depending on the exact ship and nation. So you might be thinking, well, how the heck are they managing that? And, and basically it's because the size and displacement of ships grows much more significantly um, compared to the caliber of guns. I mean, putting, putting heavier caliber guns does mean you need a larger ship, but bearing in mind that a lot of those early ships were carrying 10 or 12 guns, um, whereas later ships would be carrying 8 or 9 guns, partly because of the, the, the weight issues. Um, but ships are also getting faster, their armor needs to be getting thicker, and all of that leads to larger and larger hulls, which actually means that the amount of space available in the magazines goes up a lot, a lot quick, more quickly than the uh, the space occupied by the shells, which means that you can actually get a lot more shells in relatively the same amount of magazine space as a proportion to the size of the ship. Um, I mean, there's the classic picture i put up here which is an iowa class uh next to the hull of the oklahoma that gives you some idea of just the sheer scale difference between even what was for world war one a super dreadnought compared to the final iterations of battleships and if you if you stuck the south carolina in there it would look even smaller um but you can see that it's kind of like a, a lot, a lot bigger. I mean, displacement-wise, you're talking about over double uh, the displacement. Um, 
and obviously displacement is a function of how much water it displaces, which is a function of size. So you're talking about volumetrically at least uh, well over double um, the volume of uh, an early dreadnought, whereas it look at the, looking at the shells, the shells start out 11, 12 inch, they go up to 15, 16 inch. They haven't got anywhere near double. So uh, proportionally, a shell in a late battleship, we are generally ones armed with 15 and 16 inch weapons, actually takes up proportionally a lot less space than in a early 11 or 12 inch armed battleship, and therefore at, uh, you end up with more of them. Right, Discord questions, and I'm going to take the opportunity to address something from a couple of dry docks back, which was when uh, people were asking me about my uh, favourite, uh, what I thought was the best uh, pre- and post-war uh, cruiser class. So I'm going to address that first. Now, as a number of you quite rightly pointed out, the Algerie is in fact a pre-war design. It's actually an early 1930s design. Um, I plead illness. I have no idea why I said that. Um, it was late at night. I was high on cold and flu meds. Um, yeah, whatever. I got it wrong. Hands up. It happens. Um, but that does actually put Algeria, ironically enough, in the running for one of the best cruisers of the pre-war period. Um, and uh, I personally don't think the Takao Targos would... Takao dash Targo class would have so much of a vulnerability pre-war... Um, with their torpedoes, which a lot of people were saying they're sort of the liquid oxygen bombs on board, which I have actually made a point of pointing out um, in other videos in their wartime performance. But the thing is that radar, fire control equipment, etc., pre-war, which is what half the question was, is a lot more primitive um, and a lot less reliable, and therefore it's much less likely for hits to be scored uh, at long range in cruiser engagements, they're probably going to have to close in further. And with the long range of the long lances, I'd hope a sensible captain would offload a bunch of his long lances at a prospective target before he enters the kind of ranges where hits would actually start to become likely. Now, of course, yes, they did carry spare torpedoes and they had liquid oxygen on board, but the ready use torpedoes are the, the most vulnerable. That said, I do appreciate the vulnerability and compared to the Algerie, which has torpedoes that aren't fueled by liquid oxygen, um, I think the Algerie would displace the Takaos as uh, probably one of, if not the best, pre-war uh, cruisers. A few people have mentioned things like the Wichita's and the New Orleans. Uh, the Wichita had significant problems completing overweight, and uh, the New Orleans had a number of issues uh, with gunpowder and uh, to certain degree protection as well, well which ironically protection wasn't something the witch was short of um, so there were faults with those designs um, compared to uh, other ships like the Algerie I mean you compare the Algerie to a New Orleans um, I'm pretty sure the Algerie is coming out on top of that so I'm going to change my previous answer to say uh, it's going to be a coin toss between the towns and the Algeries and I'd actually believe it or not yes I'm British but I'm possibly actually going to edge it more towards the Algeries because unlike many heavy cruisers they actually have armor that would be capable of resisting uh, the six inch fire of the towns for a reasonable amount of engagement distance so yeah there you go unlikely winner but it's a Frenchman um, the other thing is say so the, the question was both pre and post war changes that happened during the war do mean that what is technically applicable for pre-war considerations may not have any bearing whatsoever on uh, wartime considerations. So, so things like the Brooklyn class, uh, I sort of derated a bit for not having torpedoes, and people are like, well, yeah, it's got the rate of fire. It's like, yes, but the whole fire control and range accuracy issues that I mentioned before. But go into the wartime, and the US suddenly has really good fire control computers coming in in the late 1930s, early 1940s, combined with radar. A radar-equipped, modern fire control-equipped Brooklyn is an entirely different beast from a 1935 Brooklyn. Um, so, best cruiser during wartime say it's an entirely different kettle of fish to what best pre-war cruiser would have been, because there were a whole bunch of cruisers who's had excellent latent abilities but whose uh, sort of true potential was only realized once they were given a chance to exhibit uh, 
better long distance fire control um, assisted by radar. So another Discord question, Red Prussian asks, why did the United States Navy have warships painted white and why did they stop? And the answer to this is that in the late 19th and just about scraping into the early 20th centuries, everybody had really fancy ideas about peacetime colour schemes being a way of showing off your warships and impressing everybody. So, um, weirdly enough, everybody seemed, almost everybody went for some variant mix of black, ochre, dash beige, and white in varying amounts. Um, but all resulting generally in some fairly snazzy looking ships. This was also a bit of a holdover from the Age of Sail period, and to be fair, actually, even through the late 19th century and early 20th century, when battle ranges were so close that you basically, there was no there was no real uh, modicum of usefulness for naval camouflage, because you weren't going to disguise a pre-dreadnought battleship that was 3,000 yards away from you. People are no will notice this kind of thing, um, so why bother? Um, interestingly enough, uh, ships that were meant for stealth, for other, for or to not to be seen until the last minute for various roles, like say the uh, torpedo and Polyphemus, they were actually painted in uh, some shade of grey to try and blend in with their environment. It's only at, really as gun ranges start to increase that um, the idea of camouflage partially or fully camouflaging your ship into the background into the mist and the sea color uh, and sky color actually becomes a useful option but nevertheless uh, navies did start to think about uh, what color scheme should we have during war to make ourselves less visible um, the other thing uh, in the run-up to the 20th century and slightly into it was that um, guns produced an awful lot of smoke and I mean yeah Jutland World War One there was a lot of smoke produced by gunfire you ain't seen nothing till you see like the amount of gun smoke that was produced at Tsushima or the amount of gun smoke that was produced during the Spanish American War. And for pretty much the same reasons that Age of Sail ships used to cover themselves in bright colours, it's just basically basic pattern and recognition. If you were in a close range firefight, there was every chance that with banks of gun smoke everywhere, you were only going to get a vague and indistinct hazy outline of a ship and you needed to tell at a glance whether you should be shooting that ship or not and having a nice bright garish well not too garish but distinctive paint scheme it would help with that uh, but as as, I say, as as ranges increased and the idea that war could break out a lot quicker became more and more apparent people started to drop the uh, peacetime color schemes in favor of uh, basically staying with the wartime colour schemes. The British did hold on to a, a pale-white hull scheme for quite a while for a post in places like the Mediterranean and uh, the far, far overseas, and that was more for environmental reasons, trying to keep the ships as cool as possible. Uh, but yeah, by World War One ish in the run-up to World War One most navies had just gone for some shade of grey so yeah 50 plus shades of grey was it was not is not a modern invention um it's a far more boring and mundane naval thing um just tr trust me go go, in, go into any model shop find the tamia section and line up all the different possible shades of grey you can find um well if you've got something better to do, to do i'd say do that but if you're incredibly bored try that it's uh, quite amusing Life Beyond Living asks, how many Garat 104s would it take to sink an Iowa-class battleship? Well, this is going to be fun. So in case you hadn't guessed, the Garat 104 was uh, yet another wonder weapon dreamed up by our lovely uh, continental cousins, the Germans. Because, of course, it was. Um, it was, for lack of a better term, and to be relatively accurate, it was a gigantic 14-inch recoilless rifle designed to be mounted on an aircraft that would allow them to, in theory, fire battleship shell-sized projectiles at a battleship from the air, and in theory, sink it. So, yeah, apparently somebody in Nazi Germany had seen the British attempt to mount a 12-inch battleship gun on a submarine and decided this clearly wasn't crazy enough, so they were going to mount a battleship-sized gun on an aircraft instead, because obviously this makes all the sense. Um, Testing was discontinued, and this may come as a shocking surprise to absolutely nobody, because as it turned out, the blast of a 14-inch caliber 
projectile is quite considerable regardless of whether it's coming out the front in a normal gun or whether it's coming out of the rear as a result of a recoilless rifle's counter charge. Um, with the um, overall result that the aircraft who were test firing it tended to have their tails deformed quite badly by the firing. And of course there is the fact that to mount it you need something like a Dornier 17 or a Dornier 217 which is a fairly substantial aircraft and you need to line your sh your shell and your gun up which means you have to fly in a relatively straight dive so yeah you can probably see where I'm going with this a gun that tears apart your own aircraft and requires you to fly a relatively large twin engine bomber on a straight and predictable flight path towards an Iowa-class battleship. Um, how many of these things do you think would survive long enough to fire? Because because I'm not seeing that many of them. Um, it's a great it's a great way to pad out your kill stats if you're an Iowa-class battleship's uh, AA gunners. But r I think that's probably about it. I mean, sure, if you're flying on the uh the mo the most critical attack profile, which would be a uh, firing this thing at 2,000 metres, uh, coming in at an 80 degree dive, then yeah, your your 14 inch AP projectile coming in like that is almost certainly going to penetrate the Iowa's deck armour and do a fairly serious amount of damage. Um, the chances of you living to that point are fairly slim, um, and as any good battleship uh, it ca is designed for the Iowa would be able to sustain one or two of those hits. So yeah, I mean, in, I suppose in theory you could get some kind of sort of golden BB shot where you uh, you manage to get a per near perfect deck penetration right next to the the super firing forward turret that punches straight through into the magazines and boom goes the Iowa. But how many rolls of the dice you need to get that result? I have no idea. Um, I'm just going to say an arbitrarily large amount because statistically you will eventually get it to happen, but um, I wouldn't want to be the person who has to come up with the casualty reports afterwards on the Luftwaffe side. And a separate follow-up question, what would it have been like if Japan had been granted parity in terms of naval strength with the US and the UK during the Washington Naval Treaty? Uh, well, the Washington Naval Treaty would be a very different beast at that point. Um, as I've mentioned before, in uh, similar related questions, the US was a little bit worried about the UK and Japan uh, ganging up on it, and although uh, ending the Anglo-Japanese Naval Treaty formally was part of the Washington Naval Treaty deal, a lot of what served to drive uh, Japan and Britain apart was the Japanese affront at being treated like a lesser power. If the British had sat down at the table and said, actually, we're going to treat you like an equal, um, then the Japanese would have probably seen the cancelling of the treaty as more of a formality demanded by the Americans, and their relationship would have been a lot closer, which would then have resulted in exactly what the US was afraid of, which is a combined naval force that potentially outnumbered it two to one. Uh, yeah, which is, yeah, let's just say, this is why they would never have gone for it. Uh, but let's assume for some whatever reason they did... Um, the other issues it raises is that Japan is going to have some serious economic problems actually bringing its navy up to up to the the scratch because they've got to come up with at that point now five new battleships um, minimum battleships or battle cruisers. So, and the the uh, the earthquake that they suffered in the nineteen twenties warped one of those hulls beyond recognition. So they probably end up with maybe. Three battleships and two battle cruisers, or two battle cruisers and three battleships, one or the other way around. But assuming that their economy doesn't quite keel over paying for them all, um, which is a very strong possibility, um, they would end up with seven 16 inch gun ships. Um, with the Nagatos and the whatever five they complete, uh, a lot of them armed with a significant, a significant number of them are with 10 16 inch guns. That puts the Imperial Japanese Navy, firepower wise at least, maybe if not protection wise, way ahead of everybody else. Um, 
and their ships are relatively quick as well. So you'd have a, a quick, heavily armed battle line that is significantly superior in firepower um, and whose relative lack of armour is partially compensated for by the fact that most of the opponent fleets are carrying smaller guns. Um, obviously the Royal Navy has not a large number of 15-inch guns, but most of the US Navy is 14-inch, and uh, to be honest with the Washington Naval Treaty, the Royal Navy still got quite a number of 13.5-inch gunships. So that badly unbalances things in favour of Japan. So any kind of naval treaty that did that would almost certainly have to be, rather than what it was historically, which was Japan, Japan got the Nagatos, America got most of the Colorados, and Britain got to build a miniature G3 N3 hybrid, which they called the Nelsons, you'd probably be more likely to see... Uh, well. And the fact that the uh, Japanese ships were uh, quite substantial displacement. Anyway, uh, off with, I'll get off the tangent, uh, Drac. Um, you'd probably see a Washington Naval Treaty that basically said something like, okay, pick pick your favourite eight ships that you've already had built that aren't 16 inch, um, keep those, and then everybody keeps on building 16 inch ships within the treaty limits up to the limit to make it a bit more fair. Um, so I have no idea. I mean, the British kind of they you see more Nelsons or maybe a couple of Nelsons and then some refined versions, maybe a battle cruiser variant or uh, improved battleship variant. The Americans would have to come up with something uh, along the lines of maybe a faster, improved version of the Colorados or something like that. Um, I don't know if they would have still gone for battle cruisers at that point, to be honest. Uh, but they would have had to come up with 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 some extra design there. Um, it would have been interesting, but it would not really have met the whole let's we don't want to pay stupid amounts of money because even congress by that point was saying yes we can but we'd rather not and wrapping up this episode and i appreciate that you uh, probably not answered quite as many questions this time because i've tended to give uh, significantly longer answers to fewer questions but i hope you're all right with that for this episode um paul from chicago talks about reading the account of the birkenhead disaster uh, which was a wrought iron frigate HMS Birkenhead converted into a troop ship that ran aground near South Africa. It gave us the Birkenhead trill of uh, women and children first. He says, it seems the captain's actions to save the ship made a lot of sense for a wooden ship, as wood is buoyant in a manner that iron generally is not, but the court-martial didn't seem to identify this as a contributing factor. With a follow-up question of how did Vic the Victorians train their captains in new technologies? Um, so, uh, did they attend training lectures, etc., etc.? Well, in, of course, the great tradition of reverse order answering, um, yeah, training Victorian Royal Navy captains in new technologies, that's a fun one, because half the time it was the Victorian Royal Navy captains who were coming up with the new technologies. Um, some of them of slightly more questionable usefulness than others, uh, but regardless. Um, the other thing was, technology was advancing so blasted quickly. I mean, you went from... Uh, Sort of the warrior 1860 to 1870 you went from what was effectively an iron copy of a wooden frigate with slightly upsized guns that would otherwise wouldn't be unfamiliar to nelson's navy over to something like hms devastation um which to some people looks like a pre dreadnought but as i've covered in other dry dock really isn't but is a very definitely a very different ship to hms warrior and from 1870 to 1880 you actually start getting edging towards the true pre dreadnoughts uh, via various interesting diversions um uh, sort of massive uh, rifled muzzle loaders various attempts with early breech loaders truly colossally stupidly large um sort of 16.5 and 17 inch uh, guns on pre 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 dreadnought designs uh like hms uh, sans pareil at that point in the italia class um and so on and so forth so technology was advancing so quickly at that point that to be honest in terms of any fleet wide information if you tried to brief everybody on the new technology by the time you sorted out what this new technology actually did worked out a bunch of training material and sent that round to everybody in the fleet the technology's probably been obsoleted by some kind of new technology that one or more of those officers probably invented um so outside of the basics of seamanship and how things worked uh generally new technology training was uh, 
not really a thing. Um, but this is why you start to get the rise of Royal Navy Engineers, where you had specialists whose basically their job was to learn about specific technologies and specialist stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, as the pace of technological change started to even out a little bit towards the later pre-dreadnought and early dreadnought era, where you started to just get uh, bigger versions of what you'd had previously um, and less radical technological innovations. Uh, that's where sort of fleet-wide general uh, technical training started to come into its own a bit more. To be honest, uh, when we're talking about the Birkenhead uh, incident, it's very difficult to conceptualise because the mentality of people back then was very different, at least on that ship, compared to how we think about things today. And if I sound a bit solemn, it's because I have a great deal of respect for those people uh, on that ship. For those of you not familiar, um, the Birkenhead so was a raw iron troop ship. It went to ground on an uncharted rock. Um, they tried to get it off the rock, but obviously that left the massive hole that the rock had made and it got driven back again. Um which caused even more damage, and then later on would be driven again onto the rock, which would cause it to break apart. Uh, but regardless of that, the, the ship was going down. The ship was doomed. Um, it, it, iron or wood, it, the amount the damage it had taken was going to sink it. Um, they had a number of boats, including some large ones, but the two biggest ones, which had a capacity for about 300 people all told, um, one of them they managed to get it launched in and it got immediately swamped by the waves and sank which wasn't any great help and uh, the other one was in poor repair and stuck on its uh, davits anyway so that left them with very few um, very few available spaces on what boats remained because what was left was quite small and it was general it was recognized very quickly by the officers and a lot of the men that if you announced a general abandoned ship then everyone for themselves then with a lot of obviously fairly strong fairly fit sailors and soldiers on board the women and children would in that kind of mad survival situation would just basically lose in in the fight for survival um and the boats would be swamped pulled over they'd go down maybe some of the men would make it but generally very few people would make it because everyone would be fighting for their own survival and in an iron ship as you kind of intimated, there's going to be a lot less floating wreckage left. Um, so they ordered the women and children into the boats that remained to get them away, along with uh, a few extra other people in some spare spaces once they'd ensured that most of them were off the ship. Um, they then got the horses off, because there were nine horses on board. Unfortunately, one of them broke its leg get, uh, being driven into the sea, which was about unfortunate, but the other eight, believe it or not, actually managed to swim to land. Um and then realising, although the general order to abandon ship once the women and children were clear was given, the officers and men, rea well, the officers certainly realised basically a, re a, re a revision of the same problem I just described, which was, yeah, everyone, you've got them off, but if you order the men off the ship now to save themselves, basically the only thing that's really floating in the vicinity are the boats. So they'll still be swamped even with the best of intentions so they ordered the men to stand and almost all of them did as the ship broke up and went down around them um, it was an act of tremendous self-sacrifice and it's to be perfectly honest not something I could ever see happening again in this day and age um, they, they knew what would happen if they all went to try and save themselves and for the most part, they took ownership of that and said, no, we are going to effectively sacrifice ourselves to let these other people uh, live. Some of them were rescued from the ship's rigging because, ironically, the waters that it sank in were deep enough for the ship to sink, but not deep enough for the ship to go down entirely, and the tops of the rigging were still visible. But compared to the number of people who'd waited on the deck, the number of survivors on the rigging was relatively small. To be honest, I can't see how they could have done anything better. Their fears were pretty valid. There wasn't much wreckage available for them to float, um, uh, to float, to grab onto. And the with the boats they had left, if if those two big 150-person boats each 
had been serviceable, it would have been a very different story. But with the boats they had left, a lot of people were going to die. And they chose the method that would ensure that the least number of people would die. And as I say, I can't have anything but the greatest of respect for them for that. Um, so on that cheery note, uh, I think it's time to wrap up this episode of The Dry Dock. And uh, who knows, maybe at some point I'll actually make a, a proper video about the Birkenhead. Uh, I, think that, I think they deserve that at least at some point in the future. But anyway, thank you very much for listening and uh, I hope to see you again soon.